second part of our seminar series is a presentation that's spun up from a grant that we've had from the Royal Society of Edinburgh and uh, the National Environmental Institute in China, just to bring scientists in China and scientists in Scotland working on common themes together. And a common theme in the year we applied was biodiversity. So the grant was on kind of jellyfish biodiversity. And we pushed that a little to work on the impacts of jellyfish upon uh, farm fish. So we've got Dr. Uh, Zhang Fang from Qingdao and Anna Kintner, who did a PhD here, and Morag, who is presently doing a PhD here. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm uh, Fang Zhang from the Institute of Oceanology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. And uh, today, um, uh, I stand here, talk a little about jellyfish and the fish farmers. You can uh, ch China collaborative research, and uh, together with Dr. Uh, Anna and uh, Morag. And this is the uh, plumoformian species, uh, plumoformian uh, area in China coastal sea. Here is the the mainland of China. Here is South South Korea, and uh, this area is the Bohai Sea and the East China, uh, East Sea and the East uh, Yellow Sea and the East China Sea. Here is the uh, location of our institute, institute, and also. Uh, this area is uh, the Jiaozhou Bay, and uh, the, from the end of the last century, uh, bloom, the jellyfish bloom uh, occurred in the, uh, the uh, coastal sea of uh, China, and and this is the most uh, bloomforming species, this Nemo pilima nomurai. And uh, this this species uh, distributed very uh, extensive, and uh, uh, it's uh, distributed in the East Asia marginal seas. And uh, and this is the uh, most uh, um, th this is the, the species we we focus on in the uh, jellyfish pro jellyfish uh, China jellyfish program. Last year, I will give. Uh, a presentation here about this species, but uh, today uh, we will not keep, uh, focus on this species. And another species is Cyanea nozaki, and they dis distributed the, the coastal sea of this coastal line of the, the China coastal sea. And uh, another species is Aurelia as uh, sp1. And uh, this species is a very popular species and uh, also is a relative species uh, to the UK um, and coastal land. This uh, distributed the coastal land uh, with high production and higher uh, eutrophication. And this species, um, because from 2008 to uh, th this year, uh, they have many uh, bloom events and uh, um, they uh, cloud, cloud the intake screens of the, the um, power plant in, in uh, Liaoning, Liaoning province and also Shandong province and also uh, Hebei province. So it uh, caused the very large disaster uh, there. So uh, that's why we focus on this species. So we began uh, do some research about this species. We have do uh, we have uh, set the, the we, we uh, do some uh, stock culture of this species in the lab and based on this uh, experiment material and uh, do many many re uh, experiment and um, uh, the main results of the. Uh, experiment is we found especially uh, we found the temperature from 10 to 18 uh, will uh, favorable the uh, strobia to release the ephyra uh, stage and um, uh, except the 
experiment uh, in the lab, we also do some uh, field work, uh, including observing uh, observing uh, my the surface of the uh, by the the, the uh, ships, and also we um, found we use the zooplankton net to get the ephyra stage and uh, want to know the population dynamics of this species in the Jordan Bay. And also we do the scuba diving for uh, polyps of uh, abundance variation. And um, we, we found the, uh, the polyps uh, pattern in this area, uh, in the underneath uh, the uh, water. Mm, this is the season, seasonal variation of Aurelia uh, populations, and because I I have not much time to uh, give the 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 detail, so uh, uh, finally we get the seasonal life cycle of this species in the Jojo Bay, and we now know when and where the uh, species appeared. Mm. Um, next one, I uh, talk just talk uh, the uh, the uh, jellyfish and the fish farmers this co collaboration research, and you know we I ever mentioned that this <coughs> area is the same problem. So this project just consider share the, the determinant factors for the um, problem jellyfish populations in these two sea area. So we uh, the protocol we just we want to uh, collect the uh, polyps from the different uh, from the structures in both area and uh, I want to use a genetic analysis to uh, assess the dispersal this distance of polyps haplotypes and last year we uh, finished the sampling uh, our Aurelia species in China coastal uh, water, and uh, um, we also uh, ever uh, sampled the uh, sampling the Aurelia in in the Southern Cities here, but uh, there's no this species. Um, um, uh, it's uh, um, lucky for us there. Uh, I mean, not so lucky. <laughs> uh, I and mean, there in, in China, we also appeared the Albilia bloom in October last year. So there also have a uh, relative this uh, com this same species Albilia uh, relative to to the um, UK salmon cages. So we uh, treat the species, the uh, problem species, into Albilia species. And uh, next, uh, Anna Cantor will give some detail. Uh, studies. Thank you. So as Jean Fang pointed out, um, we didn't find Aurelia to do our original intended study, so we decided to piggyback on another study that I had uh, worked on as, again, part of a mass PECRA grant, so same grant that um, Lynette had. Um, so I already had a, a sort of stopgap, well, well, backstop um, database, and we could add some more sites to that um, that would make it um, robust enough to to do a similar comparison as Zhang Fang and I had been hoping to do with Aurelia. And kind of what happened with Aurelia was that we'd found it under salmon cages and salmon barges um, here uh, three summers ago in 2013. Um, so we, we built this project around the notion that we'd go back to finding them. But what had happened in the meantime was that I made the mistake of telling the salmon companies that they were hosting um, these polyps, and they said, oh, shit, and clean them all off. So um, that was really good, really good um, practice to make sure that they were being good marine stewards, but not so good for our uh, planned study. So um, next time you find something cool like that, keep a lid on it until you've done taking your samples. Um, so. As I said, we can move over to Obelia, which is um, useful in this regard because it does call, heavily colonize a lot of salmon farms. Um, they've got, they usually are pretty lax about keeping the kelp off the sides of their um, their feed barges and their walkway structures. Um, they're pretty good about the the cages themselves, but the the sort of more static structures tend to be very heavily colonized by kelp, and then you get a lot of 
um, this lacy hydroid obelia geniculata all over them. And since they have a comparable um, life cycle and a comparable time in the plankton to Aurelia, we can say, all right, we'll, we'll use that as a model instead. Um, and so the other thing is that in 2012, I noticed a dieback of Aurelia, which had kind of kicked this whole thing off. So um, that looked like an opportunity to collect um, collect some samples before the dieback was recovered. So if, if we get um, a statistical sample from a number of sites uh, before the, a recolonization event occurs while they, they float around in their um, planktonic phase, then, or sorry, planktic, Andy, Andy keeps picking me up on that, um, then uh, you can get an idea of where the recolonization has happened um, and what, what sources um, have, have provided that after the recolonization event. So um, originally we had these three regions, uh, the northwest of Scotland, north of Skye, um, Orkney and North, we tried to get exclusively Orkney, but it turns out Orkney is a real bear to sample sometimes. So we kind of, we included one, one site just there in Port Scarra at the north, the top end of the mainland, and then um, the Shetland Islands, all on the west side, the Atlantic facing side, rather than the North Sea side. Um, we amplified and sequenced the MTC01 um, gene and used that as the comparison. Um, to look at how far the larvae were dispersing and how similar those areas were. Um, so we found that in our sample that there is weak regional south-north definition, um, which I'll spare you the AMOVA details, but there, um, there wasn't as much as I expected based on the time reported that they're, sp they're spending in the plankton. Um, Shetland and the northwest mainland are very distinct, definitely different populations with some haplotypic overlap, but statistically significant um, differences in the assemblage. And Orkney could fit in either place. So you, if you park it in with your Shetland results, you get a statistically significant result. If you park it in with your northwest mainland results, you get a statistically significant result. Some of that is probably down to how difficult it was to sample so that it's um, overall sample size is a little bit lower, but it, it is somewhat along what you'd expect based on um, a northern um, carriage of the, the, plank, the plankton by the currents. Um, but because they are traveling so far, it does suggest that they're going to be a little bit harder to control than um, we might have suggested. Um, and Morag, I'll leave that to Morag to explain why we might want to control them. Um, but if we zoom out from that local phylogeny um, to a, a, a sort of larger scale, um, these, this, this chart considers some data that was taken um, in 2001-2002 um, from a previous study. So it, part, it takes the same, same uh, mitochondrial gene marker um, and includes some, some different site samples, so um, parts of New Zealand and Japan. And you can see that there's three really distinct branches in that phylogeny. Japan is very much off on its own, New Zealand also very much off on its own, but the weird thing is what the heck's up with the North Atlantic? There's a lot in there that should be differentiated, and it's just not. So if we blow up just the North Atlantic, there's, there's very little branching in there. Um, and that's inclusive of some very distant sites. Um, so that's, that's really kind of going against what I found with a more local strategy, and it's also um, going against what you'd expect just by looking at how, how far they're displayed. Well, predicting how far they're dispersing as plankton. So there's possible limitations to that study. First of all, they had a shorter read length, um, and, and some of the um, major polymorphisms are found at the, the end of the, the MTC01 gene that, that weren't captured in the original study's read lengths. She also used um, far more limited samples. So you look at the Woods Hole sample, and it's about five total um, individuals sampled, um, and whereas we had something like, you know, six different sites with um, six, six to ten sequences from one single area in just Shetland. So it's not as, as high re resolution or statistical power. And the other really interesting thing to consider here is that because this was sampled in 2002, we might have this, this panmictic look occurring just as an artifact of time. So if this was 2002, these were sampled in 2013, 2014, have they just had plenty of time to get stirred? Um, so hopefully the fresh comparisons that Zhang Fang and I will be able to do with our new sites will clear some of that up. So we have four new sites with um, multiple samples from each in the Hebrides taken from salmon farms, um, a further four new sites in uh, Loch Aber and Loch Alsh from 2015, 
Um, from 2014, we have five sites in the Gulf of Maine, north of Cape Cod, which is its own kind of distinct um, ecosystem there, and three sites south of Cape Cod as well. So hopefully with those, um, that, that'll cover some of the short read lengths that she, that she has from, um, from Woods Hole, New Brunswick, Iceland. Um, well, not Iceland, but certainly the, the Canadian Maritimes, New England area sites would, would be covered there. So hopefully this, uh, with longer reads, that branch will get broken down a little bit better. Um, and then we can make a further comparison looking at, the, looking at some um, animals from Jiaozhou Bay if we're um, successful in, in sampling those um, and looking at where they park in with the Pacific sites. So is that itself yet another separate branch or do you see um, a time artifact of panmixis occurring here? Um, so do they, does, it, does it plug in in the middle of the Japanese samples, for example, and could we say, okay, well, if there is this artificial panmixis occurring um, as a result of time here, then we can probably blame this on that as well. So um, that, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Morag, who will tell you why we might care about Obelia, even if it's only just a substitute for Aurelia. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your patience. Nearly done. Um, yeah, so what I want to talk to you about today is the, the work moving on from the collaboration between Anna and Zhang Fang, and that's the interaction of jellyfish and Atlantic salmon, um, specifically farmed Atlantic salmon on the west coast of Scotland. So we discussed a little bit earlier about large bones of jellyfish and the, the implications they can have on power stations, but they also have massive implications for fish farming, which is particularly relevant in Scotland uh, for our economy. Um, it's been quite well publicized previously in the past. Large bones of jellyfish can lead to mass kill-offs of salmon. Um, what isn't very well understood is why this occurs. Um, it's presumed to be due to the physical damage caused by the stinging of the nematocysts, that's the stinging organelles of the jellyfish species, and the um, envenomation, so the injection of the toxin, which leads to fish death, uh, with a presumptive cause of stress um, leading to impaired osmoregulation and impaired respiration from damage to the gill tissue. Um, what hasn't been well explored is the effect of sort of lower magnitude blooms of jellyfish on sort of salmon health. Um, there's been a, a small number of studies uh, seen at the bottom here um, by um, Delanoy. That's um, he's based in Ireland, but uh, their study was looking at Shetland, where uh, a large bloom of jellyfish uh, was shown to uh, be they were shown to be vectors of bacterial disease. So Tenacibacillus maritinum is the constant agent of Tenacibacillosis which is a gill infection in Atlantic salmon. And um, following a bloom of these uh, jellyfish species, Pelagia noctiluca, um, the fish came down with tenacibacillosis in their gills. Uh, and when they investigated, they found genetically identical tenacibacillum maritinum present on the surface of the jellyfish, as well as in the gill lesions, which was very interesting. But unfortunately, they weren't able to conclusively um, determine whether the transfer was from the jellyfish to the gill surface of the salmon, or whether it was in the other direction, whether the tenacibacillum maritinum had always been present on the, uh, the gill surface and the transfer was actually to the jellyfish. Um, very little is known about the microbiome of jellyfish in general, uh, which uh, is unfortunate, but luckily for me, uh, an interesting subject for investigation. So what I've been doing at the moment is I have samples from various locations around Shetland. You might recognize this map from earlier because I stole it directly from Anna's presentation. And um, I've got three species of jellyfish that I've been looking at the bacteria present on the surface. Um, this graph is just to illustrate um, Cyania capillata, which you might be familiar with, is uh, the lion's mane jellyfish. And it's um, well known to cause uh, stinging lesions in, in, sort of, uh, in bathers, in humans, and therefore it's easy enough for people to understand that it's also going to cause lesions to the, gill, the delicate gill tissue of Atlantic salmon. However, these smaller species, Obelia and Neoturus, um, are not as commonly associated with um, stinging syndromes in humans. But it's important to remember that the gill tissue of Atlantic salmon is only, you know, one to two epithelial cell, cells thick. It's not like the thick dermis of um, human tissue. So Anna's work, um, she was looking at blooms of this is Obelia and Lydia, followed by, over here, you can see increased severity of gill pathology. So we use a gill scoring uh, system, uh, histopathological scoring, to uh, look at various parameters in the gill tissue, including lamellar fusion and clubbing and uh, necrosis, epithelial sloughing. But it uh, basically provides a composite score um, for gill trauma. 
So Anna correlated uh, increased incidence of abelia with increased uh, incidence of gill trauma, essentially. So we've looked at these species as well um, with the view that they might be capable of causing trauma to gills. Uh, the large species, of course, uh, can't pass through the net. So um, they're actually broken up against the net by strong tides. And the smaller species, abelia and neoturus, pass easily through the Atlantic salmon cage system to affect the fish. So what we did, oh, this is just an illustration of how abelia can affect the salmon. Uh, because they're small, they can be inhaled and they pass over the gills where they discharge their nematocysts. Um, because a Cyanea capillata is a slightly larger species, we broke down the analysis into two uh, two tissue areas. We looked at the tentacle tissue and the gut tissue of Cyanea capillata. Because the slime vein jellyfish, this one here, uh, it's broken up against the nets, and therefore the, the gut microbiome becomes relevant and interesting because it will be uh, the bacteria present on there will be exposed to the salmon gills as well. Uh, this is just an illustration. Unfortunately, it, it's probably not dark enough in here, but hopefully you can see this is necrosis of the gill tissue uh, caused by tenacibaculosis, tenacibaculum maritinum. So what we did is uh, we cultured uh, a variety of bacteria from the surface of the three species of jellyfish. And uh, we had a look at this is a, a breakdown of the familial uh, bacterial families present. And um, on the pie chart here, you can see that the tentacles in the gut uh, vary, uh, which was very interesting, actually, because that uh, suggests the, the, sorry, supports the hypothesis that um, there might be a core microbiome present in the different areas of these jellyfish. But um, basically, the summary of this work for, for the relevance for my project is that um, there's a variety of families of bacteria present here, some of which contain potential salmon pathogens. So there's a variety of bacterial pathogens in the marine environment that can cause uh, lesions and, and disease in Atlantic salmon gills. And um, I wanted to focus on um, further identification of, of whether these pathogens were present in our bacterial samples from the, from the jellyfish surface tissue. So uh, with 16S sequencing, we were able to determine um, bacterial identity to genus level. And with further sequencing targeted um, for Eremonis, Pseudomonas, and Vibrio in the samples that were known to contain these bacteria, uh, I've been investigating for the presence of these pathogens. And uh, I found some, which was a relief. Mm -hmm. uh, I have found Eremonis salmonicida, which, as you can imagine from the name, is a pathogen of Atlantic salmon. Uh, I've also managed to identify Vibrio splendidus, which is a pathogen uh, causes vibriosis in um, this species here. This is ras, a ballon ras, which is uh, one of the cleaner fish that they use in Atlantic salmon um, cage systems. Uh, they're just rolling out really in um, Scotland, but for, in Norway for, for many years they've been using these, these cleaner fish to control uh, sea lice. So uh, presence of these um, pathogens within the, the microbiome of the jellyfish was, was pretty exciting. I've still got a bit of work to do. I still haven't done the pseudomonas samples, so I'm not sure yet if there's any pathogenic pseudomonas species present in there. Um, but presence of Eremonis salmonista was particularly interesting as this, uh, it's not classically a marine pathogen. It tends to be a freshwater disease and uh, the bacteria actually survives very poorly in the marine environment. But uh, disease can occur, uh, outbreaks of its feronculosis, the disease is called, and it does occur in the marine environment and it's long been suggested actually that uh, vector transmission is involved in outbreaks of this disease. So uh, my, my jellyfish and jellyfish in general may be um, vectors of this bacterial pathogen. Uh, this is just a summary of results. Uh, what I really wanted to emphasize is um, presence of bacteria obviously does not always indicate disease. Um, just because the bacteria are present on the surface of the jellyfish tissue doesn't necessarily mean that they're acting as, as vectors of bacterial disease. Um, I read a paper recently that said that if, if you sequence to sufficient depth, you can see any, any marine bacteria in your the water sample, you need to take a sort of 500 litre water sample in order to see every single bacteria species, but it can be done. Um, but I think the relevance of the results is that these, these pathogens are present on the jellyfish uh, tissue. And now the interesting, the next interesting step is whether uh, during blooms of these jellyfish species, whether vector transmission is occurring between the jellyfish onto the surface of the Atlantic salmon gills, or whether trauma induced by jellyfish stinging on the gills is leading to um, a sort of modulation of the existing microbiome on the gills. So whether the bacteria is already present on the gills and um, 
sort of overgrowth or, or death of the bacteria is then leading to downstream gill disease. So the next step in my PhD project is going to be a next-gen sequencing study, seasonal study of the microbiome of Atlantic salmon gills, uh, observing the bacterial community present on the gills in a farm situation, and hopefully observing alterations to the community composition following jellyfish blooms. Um, as Anna and Zhang Fang made quite clear, uh, it's, it's not always possible to predict these blooms, and uh, unfortunately one of them might not occur in the duration of my study. But um, other on-farm events are almost certainly going to modify the, uh, the microbiome of the gills, including hydrogen peroxide treatments, again for sea lice. Uh, so I expect to see at least modulation of the uh, microbiome that way as well. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone on behalf of Anna and Zhang Fang as well for, for listening and taking the time to come to our talk. Anna, if there's any questions? Oh, we have a thank you slide as well. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you.